Amen. If I can't preach after that, I can't preach. All right, well, uh, welcome to uh, Picnic Day here at Roosevelt Community Church. Welcome to all of you. Uh, I uh, trust we're in for a fabulous time in fellowship and fun and festivities today, and I too would like to welcome you back, Phyllis. It is such a joy to see you with us. Uh, and uh, for all of you uh, today, I uh, have a special message. Uh, it's really uh, the partner to the one I did a couple of weeks ago. You know, we did a Teaching Teachers to Teach event last week, so I did a Second Timothy 3 uh, message. The week before that, though, we did Psalm 51. And I had uh, originally thought I would do Psalm 32 as the twin to that, uh, but um, uh, instead I'm going to do a topical message, uh, and that is the pathway to reconciliation. So we're really going to build on what we talked about in our Psalm 51 study, but we're going to talk specifically this morning about the pathway to reconciliation. I think we all know what reconciliation is, right? It's when there's conflict, when there's a division, when there's discord, disharmony, uh, when there's friction, and you restore the relationship. And that's what reconciliation is. And I, I suspect, uh, at least I hope, after a year and a half going through Hebrews, uh, we have a very clear understanding of what the pathway to reconciliation is as far as us being reconciled to God through what Christ has done for us at the cross. I trust that we have a very full uh, understanding of uh, the, the sinfulness of our sin and how it separates us from God. I think at this point, we even, after spending so much time uh, going through the historical background of the Old Testament to inform us with regard to uh, what's being uh, taught in the epistle of the Hebrews, I think we have a pretty good understanding of uh, even the Old Testament sacrificial system was constructed to teach us that we are sinners in need of a Savior. Uh, every sacrifice that was offered in an Old Testament context resulted in a covering for sin, but it never really took it away. Because that was only accomplished through the once-for-all death of Jesus Christ. When he died on the cross, he paid for our sins. His death is the propitiation for our sins. That means it is, that's the fancy technical theological term, which means that it actually satisfied God's righteous requirement of death, which is the punishment for sin. Uh, if you read in Genesis chapter 2, you see this is announced from the very beginning of creation. Uh, God says to Adam, on the day you disobey me, the, the day you eat from the fruit of the tree in the center of the garden, that is the, the, the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die, is the way most English Bibles read. In Hebrew, it's even more emphatic. You will absolutely, positively, unequivocally die. Now, it's not all those words, but that's the strength of the grammatical construction in Hebrew. You will incur a death sentence. And God is a righteous and just judge. So that means that he can't forgive Yajun of his sins and hold anybody else accountable and maintain his integrity as a righteous and just God. He can't forgive me. He can't forgive Darlene. He cannot forgive some of us just on the basis of us giving some token uh, statement of faith or approval without also providing a substitute. If if he, if he forgives Albert because Albert goes, you know what, I'm really sorry, God, I have sinned. I believe you will forgive me, so please forgive me. God can't forgive Albert and maintain his integrity as a righteous judge and not punish Albert's sins. Does that make sense? If he does, that truly is not fair because the punishment is death. What makes it possible for God to facilitate reconciliation with us on the basis of faith and repentance is that he has provided himself as a once for all sacrifice for sins. I am forgiven of all my sins because Christ died for me. And when he rose again the third day, it proved that he was who he claimed to be, that he accomplished what he set out to do and that God accepted his sacrifice and certified him as sinless. The propitiation for our sins has been provided for us in Christ. 
okay? Uh, my, uh, my obligation, the, the wrath that I am due, was fully dealt with at the cross. Now, it is applied to me in the context of, uh, of a new birth. When God opens my eyes to the truth that I am a sinner in need of a Savior, when He draws me to Himself, when He grants me the gift of faith and I exercise that faith in Him and come to Him in repentance, turning from my sins and dedicating my life to Him, at that point, that forgiveness is applied to me. And there is therefore now no condemnation for me because now I am in Christ Jesus. My, my sin debt has been stamped, paid in full. Not canceled, paid in full by what Christ did for me. That's what it takes for God to reconcile us to himself. God's commitment to reconcile us to himself is manifested in all of those passages that reveal the heart and the activity of God facilitating us being reconciled to him. John 3.16, God so loved the world that, he's, that he made a contract that's saying, okay, if you jump through these hoops, I'll forgive you. Is that what it says? God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but might have everlasting life. What was entailed in God giving us his son? Giving his son over to die in our place. God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ, what? Died for us. That is the nature of God's love for us and what he facilitated in order to reconcile us to himself. That's why Romans 8 is probably, uh, as, it, as it relates to the greatness of our salvation, that's, probably why, that's why Romans 8 is probably the greatest chapter in the Bible as it speaks to what it means to be saved. Paul, Paul exalts in the, in the statement, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who were in Christ. No condemnation. All of my sins have been paid for, past, present, and even future as a believer in Jesus Christ. I am forever reconciled to God. The end of that chapter even closes off with the, the definitive statement, nothing can separate me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. I can't lose my salvation because it isn't a result of anything that I have done to begin with. I am reconciled to God forever. I am one of his forever because of what he did for me in Christ. Now that's something to rejoice over, isn't it? That's something to celebrate. That's something to express thanksgiving for. That's something to contemplate on a regular basis. And in Psalm 51, when we went through that a couple of weeks, that's in a sense, from that perspective, that's in a sense of what David is saying when he says it's against you and you only I have sinned. Remember when we went through that a couple of weeks ago? Against you and you only I've sinned. Well, let me ask you, did David only sin against God? Well, in one ultimate sense, the answer is yes. But on a practical earthly level, did he not sin against Bathsheba when he sent his soldiers to her, to her house to bring her to him? Did he not sin against Uriah as well as Bathsheba when he took her for himself? Did he not sin against Uriah when he conspired to have him murdered? to cover up his transgression to begin with? Did he not sin against the nation? I think I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. When you try to figure out why Ahithophel, uh, David's chief counselor, jumped ship and aligns himself with Absalom during Absalom's rebellion, when Ahithophel has been such a faithful counselor for David all these years, what led Ahithophel to betray David was the fact that Ahithophel was Bathsheba's grandfather. That's why he goes and commits suicide uh, when it becomes evident that Absalom's not going to win. He just gives up. The, is it? Is it... Our sins, are they only against God? Well, in an ultimate sense, every sin you commit, you commit a sin against your brother, you commit a sin against your sister, against your mother, against your father, against your husband, against your wife, against your neighbor, you commit a sin against, uh, against me or anybody, you have sinned ultimately against the one uh, 
whose image each and every one of us bears. But we do sin against each other as well, do we not? I think for some of us, as believers, it is easy to get to that place where we think that we can be exclusively concerned about our relationship with God as though there is a sense in which it is truly distinct from our relationship with each other. That might be the most complicated way I could say that. But let me try, yeah. <laughs> okay, I think there's times when uh, we get to that place where we just say, you know what, I, I sinned against Charlie, or I sinned against Bob, or I sinned against Betty, or I sinned against Mary, uh, and I'm just going to ask God for forgiveness, and he knows my heart, and I'm sorry, please forgive me, and then we let it go. And we assume because it's against God and God alone that we have sinned, that that's where we can leave it. What I really want to encourage you with this morning is that the pathway of reconciliation as it relates to each and every one of us as Christians is not limited to us when we sin against God pursuing that restoration of fellowship, that reconciliation of fellowship with God. That is not all God expects of us. And that holds true with if you're the one who sinned or the one who has sinned against. In the last couple of months, on multiple occasions, I have had um, one or more members of a marriage come to me and talk about facilitating reconciliation between spouses in conflict, between kids and parents in conflict with each other, or between fellow believers in conflict with each other. There are even times when I have unbelievers talk to me about conflict. And I always point them first to Christ. I think that this is probably, from a practical perspective, the most practical theological lesson each and every one of us as Christians needs to not just learn, hear, and be reminded of, but that we need to master. If you really want to be a Christian that glorifies Christ in your life, you need to master the process of reconciliation. You need to be one who readily and regularly and successfully travels the pathway to reconciliation. Not just facilitating reconciliation between sinners and a holy God, but also one who is able to facilitate reconciliation between sinning brothers and sisters of Christ and facilitates uh, reconciliation between yourself and each other when you sin against each other or when you are sinned against by each other. Let me just get a show of hands here. First of all, all in favor of honesty in church? Okay, everybody but Eugene. We'll talk, okay? So, uh, and how many of you have sinned this year against somebody in this room? Okay? All right. So, you know what that means? That means that we're all sinners. You know, the one thing we can count on is that we will sin against each other. So, you know, the one thing that I can guarantee you in every marriage, in every home, in every family, and in every church, even the most biblical of households and families and churches, is that we will sin against each other. So, you know what we need to do? We need to practice reconciliation. We need to be those who are very familiar with traveling the pathway of reconciliation. Okay? We've got to be the kind of people that get over that prideful attitude that, that, that refuses to address my own sin or practice genuine forgiveness. And just when it happens, I'm just going to ignore it and pretend like it didn't happen and cause, because we're Christians, so we couldn't possibly sin. That is a lie out of the pit. Okay? We all sin in many ways. We all sin in thought, word, and deed. Now, your thoughts uh, generally do not directly impact each other, but I guarantee you that 
the way you think also can have an adverse impact on the relationships around you. And sometimes the way you think is evident on your face and evident through your behaviors. I already see some smiles, okay? Because you know exactly what I'm talking about. Because this is all of us. I really, this is a really easy message for me to put together because I work on this every week of my life. There is nothing that should be surprising about what I have to say to you today, uh, but there will probably be a lot of what I have to say to, to you today that is convicting. And I just want to beseech you before we start to act upon it. Act in a way that honors God as you begin to really consistently and proficiently travel the pathway of reconciliation. I would like to lay out for each of us today by way of reminder what the pathway for reconciliation is for us, not with God, but for us to be truly reconciled to each other when we sin against each other, which we will do. We're going to take a look at this this morning at two key stops along the pathway to reconciliation that are required to facilitate Real biblical reconciliation between us that can result in true unity in the faith and sweet fellowship between believers. In many ways, if you master and consistently practice what we look at this morning, you will find that the grace of God is greater than you ever imagined when you see the way he uses even our sins against each other to deepen and sweeten the bond of love that we have for each other. The grace of God is so magnificent that marriages can actually become stronger as a result of sin. Doesn't that sound weird? But if you sin and you repent of it and real forgiveness is practiced, your love for that person who has truly forgiven you will increase. And I promise you, you will sin against each other in a marriage. I promise you that, as sure as I'm standing here. One of the things that I really enjoy, uh, the the older I get, uh, the younger the couples that I sit down with to do prayer marital counseling get, and the thicker it seems to me that their rose-colored glasses are. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. He, He... you know, I just think that, why do you want to marry him? Oh, I just think the whole world of him. He's cute. He's funny. He, uh, uh, you know, he's really respectful of my parents. You know, he even went to an underwater basket weaving thing with me and enjoyed himself. And, and he likes going to Hobby Lobby. And, and he'll just stand there and hold my purse. I'm thinking... Yeah, you're going to be back in six months after you get married going, what happened to my husband? He doesn't even want to go to Hobby Lobby. He told me he hates it, and he only did it because I wanted him to. And, and then I say, what about, why do you want to marry her? Oh, are you kidding me? She likes going to rodeos. We, she comes and she just sits there. She even wears my hat while I go up to, play, uh, up to the plate at the softball game. You know, she's, she's, even, she, she's even went to a hockey game with me and, and wore a Flyers jersey. Remember when you did that, dear? <laughs> yeah. Six months. Now, in our case, it took us a year and a half. But, but, but at some point, those rose-colored glasses begin to fade. And sooner or later, you get to that point where you take them, you throw them down, jump them down on top of them, and you say, no, you're a sinner. And if you would look at them in a mirror for a moment, you would see so are you. At some point in every marriage, that's what happens. And it doesn't mean your marriage is over, and it doesn't mean that you aren't compatible. You know, the fact of the matter is none of us are compatible because we're all sinners. Okay? But you made a commitment to Christ to love your wife as Christ loved the church. You made a commitment to Christ to submit to your husband as to the Lord in everything. And you made a commitment, both of you, to pursue a one flesh relationship, okay? That takes a lot of repenting and a lot of forgiving. That takes a lot of considering the other person is more important than yourself, embracing your role and function and dedicating yourself to being God's kind of person in that relationship. 
And then when you bring kids into the mix, oh, your, your selfishness will become threefold more evident. There's going to be a need to, to facilitate reconciliation all the time in a Christian life. And I suspect all too often what most of us do is we're superficial about the process. We, we will admit that we were wrong, because there's no way to get out of that, but stop short of really repenting. And we will say we forgive, but not really practice biblical forgiveness. Okay? You cannot travel near the pathway of reconciliation and facilitate real reconciliation. Real res reconciliation is a pathway that must be traveled and there are two stops along that way. There are two rest areas that must be visited in order, in order to get to the destination of real biblical reconciliation. Now the first one, to an extent, we dealt with in detail a couple of weeks ago. And the first key stop along the way of the pathway of reconciliation is genuine repentance. Now I'm going to go ahead and surprise you with the second point here. You'll never guess it. It's actual forgiveness. But we're going to start with the first stop, okay? Genuine repentance. The first step, stop along the way of the pathway of reconciliation that must be visited to get to reconciliation is genuine repentance. Now, we already talked in Psalm 51 about the sinfulness of sin. You remember the three synonyms for sin? Uh, I'll just, you don't need to turn there. I'll just remind you of what we covered a couple of weeks ago in Psalm 51. David, in just the first couple of verses, says, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness." According to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my, here's our first word, transgressions. And then he adds to that in the next verse, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. Notice those three words that are used in the Bible. All three of them essentially refer to sin. Okay, The word sin means to miss the target. God expects us to live in an upright and righteous way. And any time we fall short of his expectation, we have sinned. He expects us to hit the target when we miss the target. Whether it is through doing something that's forbidden or failing to do something that is required, we have missed the target, that's sin. That's the general word for sin, to fall short of what God expects, to miss the target. The second word is transgression or trespass, okay? That's a word that speaks of crossing the line, doing something that's forbidden. Thou shalt not, okay? Old King James, but that's the way I memorized it, okay? So thou shalt not do this, that, or the other thing, and you do it, guess what? You committed a trespass. You know those signs that people put out in the front of their yard? No trespassing. And why? Because I own this property and you're not allowed to set foot on it. And I have clearly posted it. To, to, to step foot on my property makes you a trespasser, a transgressor. I have done something specifically forbidden. Iniquity is a word that speaks of something deserving to be punished because a corruption or a perversion of what God originally intended it. Okay? Any time we sin, we deserve to be punished because God created us in His image and in His likeness to be physical representatives of Him and who He is and what He's like in His creation. Any time you behave in a way contrary to that, you deserve pu eternal punishment because you have corrupted what God created you to be and to do. Now, David's psalm of confession here says, be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness and according to the greatness of your compassion. Blot out my transgressions. The things I've done are direct acts of disobedience to you. I violated your specific rules and I deserve to be punished. Please wipe that away. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. I have perverted what you intend me to be. Please cleanse me of that. 
Cleanse me from my sin. I know my transgressions. My sin is ever before me. Against you and you alone, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you're justified when you speak and blameless when you judge or condemn. Implication me for my sins. What I've done is evil in your sight. Now, genuine repentance begins with recognizing you've sinned against God and it's evil. I, I asked you this a couple of weeks ago. I'll ask you again today. When you sin against your husband, when you sin against your wife, when you sin against your parents, against your children, listen, if you're a biblical parent, yes, you're repenting and asking forgiveness of your kids when you discipline them in anger, when you respond in a hateful or, or uh, uh, an aggressive uh, 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 an angry way, etc. Yeah, repentance is required of all of us in every relationship. There's never a time when you're above uh, the other people around you and you don't have to humble yourself to ask for forgiveness. I think some of the most monumental, just as a personal testimony here, I think some of the most monumental occasions uh, in the relationship I have with my son that came about uh, are two times that I can remember. He was in the ages of six and seven, I think. And I, I started to discipline him in anger, and I, and I was ready to discipline him in anger. And both times I caught myself, and I stopped. The first time, I just put the spanker down, and I stepped out of the room and came back and asked for forgiveness. And the second time, I stopped and stepped out of the room and prayed and came back and asked for forgiveness, and I hadn't even started. And I think those two were probably the two occasions in disciplining my son out of all of them that had the biggest impact in him. I think they were, because he realized that I was holding myself accountable to be God's kind of person, just like I was trying to teach him that he needed to do. You've got to view your sin as evil, as an offense against God, and something that you need to repent of, but not just toward God, but also toward the person that you've sinned against. I'll remind you of what most of you know as a, uh, as a memory verse. You remember uh, 1 John chapter 1? You know what the Apostle John says? Now, remember that John is writing 1 John to people who confess Christ. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of, the, uh, of Jesus Christ so that you may know with certainty that you have eternal life. So these are people that, that would call themselves Christians and they want to know with certainty whether or not they really are. And in 1 John chapter 1, uh, verse 5, this is the message we've heard from him that is, from Jesus, and announce to you, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. And if we say we have fellowship with him, that is, with God, and yet walk in the darkness, we're lying. We're not practicing the truth. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Okay? One of the ways that you can tell whether or not you're a believer is whether or not you walk in the light whether or not you live in accordance with God's word. And by the way, speaking of living in accordance with God's word and walking in the light, if we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. Walking in the light does not mean that you, you never sin. Walking in the light does not mean that you never need to repent, that you get to that place, I confess Christ, I believe in him, and now I live a perfect righteous life. To admit my sin at this point would be to say I'm not really a Christian. Oh. If we say we have no sin, we're deceiving, notice, not God and not even each other. Who are we really deceiving? Ourselves. And the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous or just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we've not sinned, we make him a liar and his words not in us. One clear way to tell you're not a believer is to not see yourself as a sinner. Not see yourself as one who is sinning and needs to repent. A conviction of sin is an indication that you really are a Christian. 
And notice in verse 9, if we confess our sins, the word confess there is the Greek word homologeo. Yes, Kyle, it'll be on the quiz. Homologeo means to say the same thing about it, uh, about something. To confess our sins means we say the same thing about our sins that God says. Well, in Psalm 51, what does the Bible say about sin? Sin is evil. Sin is iniquity. Sin is transgression. Sin deserves to be punished. You say something hateful to your wife. You, you cast that disdaining glance at your husband. Okay? You have that, that hateful attitude or whatever. You tell a lie, no matter how small. That is a sin. That is evil. That is a transgression. That deserves to be eternally punished. And when you repent to God, that's step one. If you've committed that sin against somebody else, you also need to go to that person and ask for forgiveness. And it begins with genuine repentance. You don't walk up to the person and say, you know, Eugene, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me for the way I talk to you. It's just that you were so hard to live with that day and you you know and that tie oh my goodness let, let me don't even get me started on that and so i just couldn't help myself so it's really your fault that i sinned against you so please please forgive me for caving in to you because i really am so much better you see how i made the whole thing on him you see that that is not genuine repentance genuine repentance is i sinned it's evil uh i I have no excuse. Please forgive me. By the way, when we blame shift on others, frankly, all we're doing is behaving in accordance with our fallen nature. You'll see this in Genesis chapter 3. I know we've gone here a bunch of times, but I think it's always a good reminder. If you, if you look at Genesis chapter 3 with me for just a moment, remember that when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, in verse 8, God shows up. And he holds them accountable for the fall. Verse 8, we're told they hear the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife, they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Well, why'd they hide themselves? Because they both, both knew they were guilty and they were ashamed. And the Lord God called to the man and said, where are you? Now, why do you think he calls to him? Not because he doesn't know where he is, because he's, he's giving him an opportunity right now to repent. To step forward and say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. And so the man does. He says, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. So God said, who told you were, you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Now, if you're familiar with the account, what's the answer to that? Yes. Yes, I did. I know it was wrong. I have no excuse. Please forgive me. And you notice that's almost exactly what the man says in verse 12. The man said, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. That's, that's essentially what he says, isn't it? Right? Uh, what's he's, now, let me ask you a question. Is verse 12 factually accurate? Well, if you go back to verse 7, no, I'm sorry, verse 6, the woman acts, she takes from the tree and she eats. She saw that it was good for food, a delight to the eyes, desirable to make wise. So she took from its fruit and ate. And then what's the last part of verse 6 say? She gave also to her husband with her and he ate. So now when God shows up and asks the man, have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man says, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. Is that true? Yes. But he knows what he did was directly contrary to what God commanded. And all he did was blame who? Uh, uh, not just his wife. Well, what's they say? The woman you gave. You know what, God? It's her fault. And your fault. I, you know what? I went to sleep single. I woke up married. <laughs> okay? I didn't even get a say in it. I didn't pick her. I I was happy with all the creatures. And, and you know what? You'll see the woman does the same thing. The Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Is that true? Yes. You know what she doesn't say? I sinned. There's no excuse. Please forgive me. 
You know when we blame each other? When we do those halfway repentance acts? Okay, we haven't actually pulled off the road and pulled into the lot of genuine repentance while we're traveling the pathway of reconciliation. We have made less of our sin than what it really is. That's less than genuine repentance. You want to know why full forgiveness doesn't happen? Because we don't fully accept responsibility for our sin. We don't call our sin evil. We don't call our sin sin. We don't genuinely ultimately deal in our own heart with the inexcusable and eternally punishable nature of our sin. And it's easy to come up with lots of practical justifications for that. Well, Christ did die for all my sins. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. But if you're really wanting to be like Christ and to fulfill everything that God expects of you in this life, then when you sin, you need to repent. And it better be better than Adam's repentance. It better be better than Grandma Eve's repentance. You you, You need to set aside all excuses it can't be any of this. Oh, dear, I'm sorry. It's just that you were such a crumb all morning. I just finally couldn't take it anymore, and I cracked. Please forgive me. Okay, that's not repentance. Even if all the rest of that is true, what does God expect of me? To be God's kind of husband. To love my wife as Christ loved the church. Okay, how did Christ love the church? God demonstrated his love toward us in that once we repented and proved that we really were worthy of his love, he sent his son to die for us. Is that what it says? God demonstrated his love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ what? Died for us. Okay? What God expects of us is to be like Christ, to fully accept responsibility for our sins. When we ask for forgiveness... We need to not just mean it. We need to be genuine and sincere and clear. Even in our own hearts. I remind you in 1 John 1. uh, I'll let the page slip. But in, in 1 John 1, he says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive. Yeah, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving whom? Ourselves. Listen. That kind of a partial repentance is practicing self-deception. That's all it is. You want to know why sometimes it is that people might have forgiving you, especially the people that know you the best, that spend the most time with you, that you're closest with? You want to know why it might be a little hard for them to truly believe your confession? Because your confession is not fully genuine. We need, to, we need to genuinely repent. We need to admit our sin and ask for forgiveness. And by the way, uh, it is, it, it is incumbent. I know that Matthew 18 says that if your brother offends you, then it is your responsibility to go to him and show him his fault in private. Right? I, I, that's true. We'll talk about that in a minute. It is true that if you sin against me, it's up to me to pursue reconciliation. But I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Matthew 5 with me for a minute. I want you to see this. Matthew 5, verse 21. Actually, we're going to start in verse 20. Matthew 5, verse 20. Jesus makes a statement. He says, I say to you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, that's a monumental statement in this in this first century context, because you want to know whoever who everybody looked up to as far as the spiritual uh, heroes go. Uh, Of all the people that lived in Israel in those days, scribes and Pharisees are the ones who from an outward perspective, most looked like they were righteous. They worked diligently to keep the law as, as precisely as possible, even tithing from the smallest of spices, uh, wearing phylacteries 
uh, uh, wearing their, uh, the, the, the dust on their head and the whole bit, fasting a couple of times a week, and on it goes, and, and doing all of the religious rituals, faithfully attending the temple and the, for all the, uh, the, the events and offering up all the right sacrifices. If there was anybody in that day that, that were diligently keeping the law to the best that anybody could keep it, it's the scribes and Pharisees. And Jesus says this shocking statement, I say to you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of scribes and Pharisees, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. The best that man's righteousness has to offer falls very, very far short of being able to get into God's kingdom. And then he goes through to illustrate why. He says, you have heard that the ancients were told you shall not commit murder. Now that comes right from where? Who are the ancients? Those people in Moses' day? And what does this commandment come from? The Ten Commandments, you shall not commit murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to, to the court. Well, what's that, what's that referring to? Well, you read through the Ten Commandments, you read through the legal stipulations afterwards, capital punishment for a capital offense. Notice how Jesus takes this, this elementary uh, statement, this elementary legal code, and elevates it to the real divine standard that's always been God's expectation. I say to you, everyone who's angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. Well, what's the Supreme Court? It's not in Washington. That's, that's God's court, right? This is eternal judgment he's talking about here. And whoever says you fool shall be guilty enough not to get stoned for committing the act of murder, but to go into the fiery hell for a hateful word. That's God's real standard. Notice in verse 23, then, the application that Jesus draws from this. You see that first word, therefore? This is his conclusion. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar. Now, keep this in mind. The altar was in the temple. This is where all those sacrifices are made. People stand in line for hours to get up to be able to present their offering. If you're there at the altar, that means you already got your animal. That means you already made the trip to Jerusalem from wherever you're living. That means you got up to your turn in line and you have your animal in hand. And you are ready to do the sacrifice. One of the things that priests had you do was they would give you the knife. It would be up to you to slit the throat of the animal. And then they would complete the rest of the sacrifice for you. Because you're identifying yourself with that animal. You are offering up a sacrifice to God. Sometimes it's a sin offering. Sometimes it's a free will offering. Sometimes it's prescribed, etc. Like on the Passover. He says, if you're presenting your offering at the altar, you're at that highest exercise of worship of God in his very presence, ready to present this, at this animal sacrifice. And there you remember that your brother has something against you. Now that's interesting. You're standing there ready to do this great noble act of worship to God. And then you remember, you know what? I sinned against Mark. I sinned against Janice. I sinned. Well, what do you do? Well, you ask for forgiveness right there and go ahead and finish your offering and commit to God to go make things right. No. What's, what's Jesus say? If you are presenting your offering at the altar and there you remember your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and present your offering. You see the priority here? You can't just worship God and assume there's no obligation or expectation that God has of you to repent with regard to the relationship you have with each other. It is incumbent upon you as soon as you realize there's somebody I sinned against. I need to stop and go and be reconciled. That's the urgency. And in the context of this offering, Jesus is even making, making it clear, God isn't interested in receiving any prayers from you, any worship, any sacrifice from you, until you go obey him and, and repent and reconcile with your brother. Then you can come back and make your offering. Do you practice repentance like that in your life? That's what genuine repentance looks like on an individual level. That's what God expects of us. That's it right there. 
Now, on the flip side, you have Matthew 18. Matthew 18, verse 15 says, If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private, and if he listens to you, you've won your brother. Yeah, if you're the one that sinned against, it's up to you to pursue reconciliation. It's up for, to you to sit down with your brother privately. You don't bring a bunch of other people in. You don't, you don't turn it into a gang assault. It's just you and your brother. You keep that offense between the two of you. You don't go talk to other people about it. You don't send some note out through the prayer chain. You don't call the two or three friends. You know what my husband did? Oh, my. Well, you probably should talk to him. Oh, I was thinking about getting pastor involved. Well, you know what? When you call me, I promise you this is what you will hear. Have you on an individual level gone privately to him? And have you told anybody else about it? Because if you did, you need to ask him for forgiveness for that. And you need to go back and repent with them as well. Oh, that's not fair. I'm not calling pastor anymore. Okay, listen. This is, I'm just talking about the basic pathway of reconciliation. Okay? Sins happen. We have a tendency to get this, this judicial, wrathful attitude when I'm sinned against. We get angry. We get offended. We get hurt. We get upset. Well, some of us, when we get hurt, and listen, I'm in the group. When I get hurt, uh, even if it's a careless dog, man, when, when the dog hurts me, my immediate reaction, I've worked hard to control it, but my immediate reaction is going to just shoot it. Okay? <laughs> Ow! The dog weighs almost what I do. And everybody knows cats are better. <laughs> Look, it, does, it, does it hurt? Is it upsetting to be offended, to be sinned against? Yeah. And within the context of our marriages and our homes and our regular relationships, even within this household, are there not sins that we commit against each other? Are there not foibles that we have that aren't even necessarily sinful, but they can rub each other the wrong way? Yeah. What's the, what's the first stop in the pathway to reconciliation? When you do sin, you need to repent. You need to go back to that person. Recognize the fact that God, you, God isn't interested in hearing from you. I mean, you can say, God, I sin, please forgive. It's against you and you only that I sin, please forgive me. But now I'm going to be obedient to you and go ask my wife for forgiveness. Go ask my husband for forgiveness. Go ask my son or my daughter for forgiveness. Go ask my mom or dad or for forgiveness. Go ask so-and-so from church or from work forgiveness. By the way, uh, I think I've been meddling most of this morning, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to super meddle now. You realize that God doesn't just expect you to go back and ask forgiveness from fellow believers. Do you understand that? When I sin against an unbeliever, I got to go ask them for forgiveness too. I still to this day, I remember standing in the hallway. I, mean, I, I, I worked in a cube farm. Uh, that's an office where it's all technology guys and everybody's office is a cubicle. And if you're really important, you have a bigger, taller walls. Okay. I still remember sinning. Uh, I just, I just told a lie. I don't even know. It was the dumbest thing ever. Uh, maybe not the dumbest thing ever, but it sure felt like it. The people were talking about whitewater rafting and I said, oh yeah, I'd done that. And as soon as it came out of my mouth, I went, I know I haven't. Why did I say that? I was, and there's like 10 people there eight people, whatever. And I felt so bad and ashamed and I went back to my desk and I asked God for forgiveness, please forgive me. And all I could think is, if I'm reading 1 John 30 times, of course. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I see the MacArthur tapes there. I can't, it takes me about 10 minutes to get up the nerve to go back and admit that I just sinned and ask forgiveness from everybody. Uh, and I remember going, please, Lord, can't you just accept it? But it just, first John just screamed at me. So I asked him to help me have the strength and courage to go and be honest. And then as I start to walk back, I started praying, oh, God, please let all the people be there and the conversation still being going on. Because the last thing I want to do is go to talk to 10 different people individually. And by God's grace, they were all there. And I step up and, you know, I, 
I must have looked sheepish or something because they're all talking and then there's this pa pregnant pause. You ever had one of those and then everybody looks at you? And I said, yeah, you know what, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta ask all you guys for forgiveness. I said that I had done whitewater rafting. I never had, that was a lie. Uh, that was a sin against God and against you guys. Will you please forgive me? <laughs> they looked at me like I had three noses. Some of them were like, yeah, Brian, whatever. Uh, and, and the rest were like, of course, yeah, okay, sorry. And one guy, I think one guy might even said, yeah, I, I was wondering, Brian, because I didn't think you did, but yeah, it's all good. <laughs> and I was a new believer. But I, that's, that moment, that day, that event still, still rings in my heart. It's, it, that was a catalyst to move me to repent of sins in my marriage, which I do all the time. Listen, this is the pathway, the first stop on the pathway of genuine, repent, uh, genuine reconciliation. It's genuine repentance. The pathway to reconciliation, you want to get to reconciliation, you got to really repent of your sins, okay? If somebody sins against you, you got to go after them. you got to want to restore that relationship as much as God wants, you to, wants that relationship restored. And if you're the one that sins, you got to pursue reconciliation with genuine repentance because your relationship with God your fellowship with God is dependent upon it. He's not interested in worship from you in any other ways until you repent of your sin. Does that make sense? You have to pursue reconciliation. And you got to ask for forgiveness. You got to commit to change and all those other things we talked about last time. And the second stop in the pathway is every bit as important and it is actual forgiveness. When a person repents, there must be, in order to actually facilitate reconciliation, there must be genuine, true, actual forgiveness as well. It can't be just a, a, a flippant, okay, yeah, what, right, whatever, you're going to do it again, but all right, I know I'm supposed to say you're forgiven, okay, you're forgiven, but moving on. You know, I want to take you to one passage and show you what real forgiveness looks like from God's perspective, and then one passage to help you see that that's the kind of forgiveness God expects of us, okay? Take your Bibles and turn with me to Luke 15. Luke 15. Now, we're going to set the context for this chapter first. We're going to walk through the three parables and draw a couple of lessons. And then we're going to go to one more passage and draw this all to a conclusion. Are you ready? Luke 15. Notice the context that Luke lays out for us. All the tax collectors and sinners are coming near Jesus to listen to him. And both the Pharisees and the scribes are grumbling, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Verse 3, so he told them this parable. Now, who is the them Jesus is telling the parable to? And in fact, there's going to be three of them. To the scribes and Pharisees who are grumbling over tax collectors and sinners coming to Jesus, and Jesus being willing to eat with them. Okay? So notice, tax collectors and sinners are coming to Jesus to listen to him. Okay? And uh, 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 he was even willing to eat with them, is what we're told. And the Pharisees and the scribes are complaining that Jesus is receptive to these evil, wicked, mean, bad, nasty uh, people coming to him. If Jesus really was a prophet, what would he do? He would shun all of them and hang out with us, the scribes and Pharisees, the people who are really religious, right? Jesus tells them, the Pharisees and scribes, this parable, saying, What man among you, if he had his 100 sheep and has lost one of them, doesn't leave the 99 in the open pasture and go after the one which was lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my sheep which was lost. I tell you, in the same way, there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. What's the point of the parable? 
Remember, a parable is an earthly story. It's a very understandable story that everybody would be able to relate to, but it's meant to teach a spiritual truth. These scribes and Pharisees are looking at Jesus and finding fault with him, being willing to, to receive evil, wicked, mean, bad, nasty tax collectors and sinners. And so he tells them, okay, which of you, if you're a shepherd, and you had a hundred sheep, and one of them strays, one of them goes evil, wicked, mean, bad, nasty, wanders from the fold, which one of you would just go, well, that's all right. I got the 99 good ones, good riddance. Would any of you do that? No. You want your sheep back, and you'd go after them. And when you get your sheep, and you bring it back, what are you going to do? You're going to, when you get home, you're going to call together all the people who are your friends and your neighbors, all the people close to you that you have a relationship with, and you're going to want to what? Celebrate. By all of you getting together and taking turns beating that bad, horrible, nasty sheep that wandered away. No. You're going to celebrate, hey, it was lost and I got it back, right? We're not all jumping on the ba uh, pound the bad sheep bandwagon here. We're, we're happy. You know, I thought we lost it, but we got it back. Woohoo! Notice he continues with another parable. And it's obvious that it's still continuing the same thought. He says, or what woman, if she has 10 silver coins and loses one, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search diligently until she finds it. And when she's found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, rejoice. I found the coin which I had lost. In the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. In the same way, a woman, let's just say they're $100 bills for the sake of argument, okay? She has $1,000 bills and she loses one. Ah, oh, well, I got the nine good ones. How many of you ladies would be like that? You have $1,000. Look at, look at, look at Barbara's even making the squish face. Oh, no, that ain't never happening, right? I got $1,000 bills. I lose one. Oh, well, it just grows on trees anyways, right? No, you're going to look until you find it. When you find it, what are you going to do? Oh, this needs to go out through the prayer chain. I want everybody celebrating. I lost a $100 bill, but I found it. Woo-hoo, right? The same way. There is joy in the presence of the angels of God. Well, where are the angels of God? In heaven. Well, who is in their presence? God. So when he says there's joy in the presence of the angels in heaven, who's showing the joy? God. God celebrates when one sinner repents. You want to know why I hang out with evil, wicked, mean, bad, and nasty? Because God celebrates when one of them comes home. And he wants them all reconciled to himself. But by the way, if you're having trouble for forgiving, okay, that's part of your problem right there. You don't want to restore. You see yourself as better than them. You'd be happy to write them off. I've, I've been in this church since May of 2000. Okay, I've been here over 23 years. I'm here to tell you, one of the most grievous experiences that I have had here is dealing with people who have written off relationships because of problems and left. Those are some of the most difficult heartbreaks that I've experienced in the whole of my, my Christian life. When people write off relationships uh, and sever relationships because there's a desire not to repent, not to forgive, not to reconcile. I just forget it. I'm going to go somewhere else. You are never more unlike God than when you refuse to reconcile or don't rejoice over reconciliation. Verse 11. And he said, a man had two sons. Now, we always attribute this to the parable of the prodigal son, right? It's not the parable of the prodigal son. It's either the parable of the lost sons, plural, or the parable of the loving father, singular. Watch this. The younger of those sons, this man has two sons. He said to his father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. And there's a whole bunch can be said here. Like, Dad, I wish you were dead. Can I have my inheritance now? Okay, so the prodigal son that takes his share of the inheritance and leaves and goes and squanders it, oh yeah, that's evil, no question. 
Not many days later, he gathers everything together, went on a journey into a distant country, squandered his estate with loose living. Okay? He behaved in an immoral way, blew the whole thing. When he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that were uh, that the swine were eating, but no one gave anything to him. He is lost, forsaken, destitute, would even be happy to eat the pig slop. And he comes to his senses, verse 17, and says, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I'm dying here with hunger. I'm going to get up, and I'm going to go to my father, and I'm going to say to him, Father, notice. I'm sorry. I didn't think things through. Uh, can we restart? No. What does he say? Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Please make me as one of your hired men. That's real repentance. Like what we were talking about before. And so he gets up and he comes to his father. You want to see what, what uh, actual forgiveness looks like? Notice how the father stands on the front porch, arms folded, grumpy look on his face. You can hear the <laughs> and the red lightsaber kicks out, right? No. He gets up and comes to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. The son hasn't said a word yet. The son hasn't said a word yet. See, this is what actual forgiveness, this is what a forgiving heart looks like. It wants the restored relationship. There's love, there's affection, there's the treasuring of the person in spite of the offense. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the hurt it must have been that this father went through? Dad, I wish you were dead. Can I have my share of the inheritance now? And then I'm gonna pack everything up, sell it all up, liquidate it, and go out and live the way I want to. And when he comes back, the father does not wait, doesn't wait to hear anything. He runs and meets him. The son then says to the father, and I, again, you see genuine repentance on display. Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Notice he doesn't even get to say, please just hire me as one of your lackeys. He doesn't even get to say that. Why? Because look what dad says. The father says to his slaves, quickly, bring out the best robe, put it on and put a ring on his hand, put sandals on his feet, bring the fattened calf, kill it, let us eat and celebrate because this son of mine was dead and he has come alive again. He was lost and he has been found. Okay. That's the celebration that should happen in your marriage, in your family, in your home, in this church. That's the celebration that should happen in your heart when somebody comes back to you and asks for forgiveness. Notice the other half of the parable. It's the other son who is also not really rightly related to his dad. His older son was in the field. When he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. Now, if this son is in good relation with his dad, really does love his dad, he gets home from working and he sees there's a party going on in the house. Hey, what I miss? Let me clean up and join the party, right? <laughs> That's not what happens, though. He summons one of the servants and says, well, what, what, what's going on? Verse 27, he said to him, your brother has come. Your father killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. And at this point, the brother becomes what? Angry. And wouldn't even go in. His father came out, began pleading with him. But he answered and said to his father, Look, for so many years I have been serving you. That word serving is a strong word for serving. I've been your slave. <laughs> and I have never neglected a command of yours, and yet you never have given me a goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of, this son of yours, notice he doesn't call him his brother, this son of yours came who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed a fattened calf for him? I want no part of this. 
He said to him, son, you have always been with me and everything that I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live, was lost and has been found. Do you know the, you know the only brother that's lost at this point is the one that's been home the whole time who's hard-hearted and stiff-necked toward his dad. And the only reason he's serving his dad is so that he can get what he wants. Now you go back to verses 1 and 2 and you see why Jesus tells this parable to the Pharisees and the scribes who were complaining that Jesus was receiving tax collectors and sinners. Because we have a loving Father that genuinely wants to be reconciled to us. Genuinely rejoices. He doesn't, you know what? God doesn't meet us halfway in repentance in order to facilitate reconciliation, does he? He comes all the way. God demonstrates his love toward us and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The, the, the death of Christ is not contingent upon us turning things around and obeying from this point forward, is it? Now, that's what he calls us to do. But if you've been a believer for more than five years, you have had to work through in your heart that idea of, Lord, I'm, I'm sinning again in this way. I, you will have had to, within five years of being a believer, at some point, if you really are a believer and you really are biblically dealing with your sin you have had to come to that place where you've realized you've asked forgiveness for the same sin so many times you can't even keep track of them anymore and you feel ashamed to ask again and should I ask again Lord I know that this is the same attitude I just had yesterday the same attitude I just had this morning the same thing I just did Lord please forgive me but I, I, I just am losing to my flesh Losing and losing and losing. And you know what? God keeps forgiving, doesn't he? Now, as we close, let me have you turn your Bibles to Ephesians. I want you to look at the end of chapter 4. Verse 31. This is what the put off, put on practice looks like. He says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Set aside all those things of, of being bitter toward each other, being hateful, uh, mean, nasty. Put all that stuff aside and instead, what's the put on? Verse 32, be kind to one another, tender hearted. And here's the kicker. What's he say? Forgiving whom? Each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven whom? You. You want to know what it takes to truly facilitate reconciliation in a relationship, in your marriages, with your kids, with each other? You want to know what it takes? There are two stops that you have to visit along the pathway to reconciliation. The first one is genuine repentance. You got to admit that you've sinned. And if somebody sins against you, you got to go after them. God went after you, didn't he? The, the loving father went after his prodigal son. He only got halfway home. Christ demonstrated his love toward us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God doesn't wait for us to facilitate reconciliation. In fact, the Great Commission is a mandate from God to us as a church to go into all the world to try to facilitate reconciliation with those who are lost. Amen? Well, what makes you think that God is any less interested in facilitating reconciliation within this household of faith and within every one of our households within this household of faith? He expects genuine repentance. If you sin, you pursue facilitating reconciliation by going back and asking for forgiveness. Oh, yeah, but he didn't grant it. Oh, yeah, but she doesn't grant it. Well, that's the other stop that has to be visited. You have to grant actual forgiveness. You have to actually forgive. You know what really forgiving means? How has God forgiven you of your sins? Has he forgiven you of all, some, or most of your sins? All, right? Has he forgiven you of all, some, or most of the sins you remember to confess? Oh, tricky one. Have you confessed every sin ever? 
Catholicism is founded on this lie. Okay? Have you confessed every sin ever? And yet, has he forgiven you for all of them? Has he forgiven you for all, some, or most of the sins you failed to see as sins to begin with? Oh, pastor, you're meddling again. And how does he treat you, having forgiven you of all of your sins? Are you that sheep that repents and comes back? Or he has to go out into the far pasture and dig you out of the hole and bring you back and then gather all of his friends together and they all take turns beating you up for gone uh, astray yet again? Or does he forgive you in total and just rejoice that he has that relationship back? Okay, that is the expectation God has of us on the forgiveness side. And I suspect that's probably the side that in our church we have most need uh, to give full attention to. When I forgive somebody, I agree not to bring it up to that person again. I agree not to mention it to others again. I ab agree not to even dwell on it in my own heart and my own mind. I, I agree with God that you are truly forgiven and it, I hold it not at all against you and I am genuinely thrilled to have that relationship back. That's what real forgiveness looks like. And that's what God calls us to do. Biblical forgiveness leads to reconciliation. It leads to love and a restored relationship. A failure to forgive like this leads to bitterness, resentment, anger, self-pity, sometimes even depression and a host of other sins against the person, including presuming the worst about that person, finding fault with that person even when there is none, and an intolerance for that person and an unwillingness to even be in the room with them. If you see any of these characteristics in your heart toward another person, it is probably because you're for forgiving, or, or, excuse me, refusing to forgive them. And that is sin as much as the sin committed against you in the first place was. You know, when Jesus taught us to pray in Matthew chapter 6, I find it amazing that when, when they say, Jesus, teach us to pray, he says, when you're praying, don't use meaningless repetition. Uh, your father knows what you need before you ask. When you pray, pray like this, Matthew 6. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And you know, that verse, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors, should speak volumes in our hearts as believers. Okay? When you're sinned against, God expects you to forgive others like he has forgiven you. And if you pray the way Jesus taught us to pray, you're actually asking him to forgive you just like you forgive others. And of all of the things that Jesus teaches in this passage on prayer, the only one he revisits is this statement, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And he includes this explanation in verses 14 and 15. He says, for if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive others, your heavenly father will not forgive your transgressions. The lack of a forgiving heart is a pretty clear sign you're maybe not even a believer. Because believers, the one thing that we know to start with is that we're sinners in need of a savior. And the joy of my salvation is knowing that despite my mountain of sin, God has forgiven all of it, right? Now, if I've been forgiven of everything, how could I not forgive you of anything? Make sense? Father, thank you so much for paving the pathway to reconciliation in gold covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. 
help us to travel this pathway regularly with each other, both repenting of our sins and in forgiving each other as we commit sins against each other. And may we indeed, by your grace, be in closer communion and fellowship in our marriages, in our homes and families, and in this church. May we have sweet fellowship with each other that gets better even in spite of, indeed, by your grace, because of the sins we commit against each other, when we repent and truly forgive, so that we might really be lights in a dark world that shine forth what a real Christian life looks like, so that others might see our good deeds, our humble hearts, our repentant attitudes, and our forgiving nature, and glorify you, our Father who is in heaven, in whose name I pray, amen.